Hello and welcome to Downtown Download. I will give a few minutes for our guests to join. I see the numbers rising. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you, thank you and welcome. As our guests arrive, today is going to be a really great power pack show. And so we are excited that you're joining us. So let me start now. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to this week's Downtown Download. I'm Downtown Partnerships President Shalonda Stokes. And I have my, my colleague who I will introduce in a moment, um, the Honorable Councilman Eric Costello. I just want to thank you all for tuning in today and, and for all of the shows throughout the year. This is our last one of 2020, which has been an interesting year. Um, but I thank you for your commitment to, to riding the wave with us. I thank you for uh, tuning in, for providing input into what we talk about, giving us thoughtful questions. And I encourage you to continue to do so as we you know, start 2021 with a bang. So thank you, thank you, thank you for that. I also wanna congratulate, I mean, there's been a lot that's happened um, over the last week. I wanna congratulate new, newly elected Mayor Brandon Scott and I'm thankful I have the honor of serving on his transition team with the Business Workforce and Neighborhood Development Committee. Um, I'm co-chairing that with Gerald Jackson. I'm also part of Comptroller ben, Bill Henry's uh, transition team. And so the two of them have assembled some of the best minds in Baltimore. We know to flush out all of the priorities. But while we're here today, there are a couple of things that we wanna do in shouting out the council have to start out with um, Council President Nick Mosby. Um, and so congratulations to you. But my co-host, Councilman Eric Costello, I know we've had many conversations, many um, strategy sessions and all of that. And I cannot think of someone more deserving um, in really representing the way that you do. I say it all of the time, you, you're very thoughtful in what you do, you're knowledgeable about all of this. And so I wanna congratulate you on your new term and the chairmanship of the Ways and Means Committee. I know you also serve as a member of the Public Safety and Government Operations and Oversight Committees. And so, you know, I don't know about you, but with the challenges presented by COVID-19, I'm extremely optimistic about this new administration and where our city is, is headed. So today is just one big example of how things are moving forward you know, after 17 years and numerous stalled attempts, the Superblock Project has a new development team called the West Side Partners. And while that group is, is new in, in its formation, the members have extremely deep roots in our community. And so I'm looking forward to introducing them. For those of you who don't know them, that's if you've been living under a rock, but I'll introduce them in just a moment. First, I wanna share a few developments that, you know, projects that are happening in downtown as well. And so we know that even with this global pandemic and none of us have been here before, um, it can't keep downtown down. You know, Baltimore is resilient and we see that in the numerous developments and people who are willing to invest in us in our city. And so I'd like to start off, you know, just to talk about a couple, um, Burns and Associates and David Gupta acquired the Vickers Building and that's at 225 East Redwood and, and Garrett Building at 233 East Redwood. I know they have a vision for a Main Street style development there. You know, the buildings will undergo a $5 million uh, renovation and reopen with public facing office, event space and a retail space to really energize that part of Charles Center. I had an opportunity to tour those spaces and it's an amazingly beautiful building. Um, across downtown though, at 300 West Redwood, the Redwood Campus Center will open next summer in the former City Crescent building. And this you know, innovative apartment community is engineered for the post COVID world with single occupancy residences. Um, they have enhanced air filtration, UV treatments, um, increased elevator ratios, I expect this will be a very popular address for students, faculty, and staff at the University of Maryland Baltimore campus that's right down the street. And we don't have a rendering, um, but I'm excited to announce that a new bookstore, Viva Books, is coming to Brown's Arcade at 322 North Charles Street, where both the retail space and upstairs apartments have been completely renovated. 
And so we know over the 400 block, I'm almost done, just a couple more, but just to show the energy of what's happening on the 400 block of Park Avenue, Dwell in the Parks is the next big project by Parks Avenue Partners. The residential building will be just one block south of the Mount Vernon Marketplace, adding even more residential density to the Bromo Arts District. And the last one I wanna talk about is just University Lofts. And that's a project from the University of Maryland, Baltimore to add more downtown campus housing. It's underway at 100 North Utah Street. And this is the existing bank building where it's being converted and expanded, comprising of apartment units, associated amenities and street level retail. So just wanted to share with you a few of those projects in the pipeline um, before we get to today's main topic, you know, and it just, as I mentioned, show the resiliency of downtown and how people are still willing to invest in and how this is just such a great place to be. But I recognize we're not out of the woods yet. And so, you know, particular, particularly when it comes to restaurants who we know are really hurting right now. And so um, as a co-producer of Baltimore Restaurant Week with Visit Baltimore, Downtown Partnership knows how important our restaurants are, not just to Baltimore's economy, but to our soul. You know what I mean? They're a big part of what makes our city so special. And so we're committed to our restaurants and helping in any way that we can. We're promoting their pivot to takeout um, with the sale of pantry items and other items. And so we relaunched our curbside Baltimore gift card program. And so if you have not purchased already, please do. Um, and we're about to team up with Visit Baltimore now to announce a rally around the restaurants that will put the full weight of our marketing and social media channels, you know, really in support of this latest shutdown, but to make sure that all of those restaurants stay in front and center. And so I urge everyone to please, please, please join this effort. Place an order directly with the local restaurant if you can. Uh, Want to make sure, as we know, the delivery apps take a, a large percentage of theirs. We encourage you to, to buy direct, to buy big gift cards now to help them through this time. Tell your friends for Christmas, give gift cards, tip well, and, and advocate you know, for this next round of stimulus. Part of what we recognize is if we want our restaurants and our community to be here for us in the summer, we need to support them now through the winter. And so the other thing that we've done, and I'm almost done councilman, it's just so much good stuff happening, um, but to help our local retail scene, we opened a holiday pop-up shop and that's at Center Plaza. Um, the store has locally made products from 20 of Baltimore's makers, craftspeople. Um, we have cards, clothing, chocolates, tea, skincare, and so much more. Um, it's open from noon to 7 p.m. on Wednesday through Sunday until December 23rd. And you know, we want to make sure we, we are doing our part to make sure that we slow the spread of COVID. And so the shop is cast, cashless, masks are required, and we're following the city's latest guidelines on limiting the number of people who are able to shop at any point in time. So you can learn about the shop, the curbside Baltimore gift card in initiative where we are adding money to, to the gift card to purchase all on our website at GoDowntownBaltimore.com. So no matter who it is, please support these local businesses. Please, 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 we need you. So Councilman, after I've taken up all of that time, I, I wanna give you the stage and I wanna use this as an opportunity to really thank you for your commitment. This is our last show. You've been an amazing partner. You've been an amazing representative for our district. And so, you know, just as my public, thank you for all that you've done. That's my updates. Um, did you have anything you wanted to share before we introduce our guests? Thanks, Alanda. Yeah, I have a, a few updates, um, a couple city related things. Uh, so first, uh, we should be, exp actually, before I get into those updates, I wanna take a moment to congratulate uh, Mayor Brandon Scott, uh, Council President Nick Mosby, uh, Comptroller Bill Henry, as well as my five uh, new colleagues on the council. Councilman Mark Conway from the 4th District, Councilman James Torrance from the 7th, Councilwoman Felicia Porter from the 10th, Councilman Tony Glover from the 13th, and Councilwoman Odette Ramos from the 14th District. Uh, really looking forward to working with each and every one of them, uh, as well as our existing colleagues to help move the city forward. A um, couple quick updates. First, uh, curbside recycling was set to resume this week. Uh, so we are expecting an announcement from the administration. Uh, I'm not sure if we're going to see that today or later in the week, uh, but please stay tuned for that. 
Uh, number two, uh, as many people are aware, there was an executive order uh, that was issued uh, last week uh, with modifications to the previous one. I'm gonna put a link in uh, the chat window. Uh, bear with me for one moment, uh, all panelists and attendees. Uh, that's going to include a uh, summary of um, what has changed, uh, as well as uh, a link to the press release from the mayor, as well as the exact language in the executive order. Uh, today at 12.30 p.m., uh, the mayor will be doing a press conference, uh, giving updates on the city's snow preparedness, uh, which includes road treatment and snow removal. Uh, please stay tuned for that. I uh, want to encourage everyone to continue to shop local this holiday season. As uh, Shalanda said uh, in, in different words, but essentially meant the same thing. Our small business community really needs our support now uh, more than ever. Uh, so what I'm gonna include in, in the window are four links. Uh, the first one is to uh, the Charles Street Holiday Shopping Guide, which includes small businesses in downtown and going up through Mount Vernon. Uh, the second one is the Holiday Shopping Guide for Market Center, which is our area around Lexington Market. I've also included a pop-up uh, for, uh, or excuse me, a link for the Downtown Partnership Holiday Pop-up, uh, as well as the Made in Baltimore Pop-up, where you can find uh, items that are produced by local makers uh, and manufacturers. Uh, and lastly, uh, I want to take a moment uh, to thank Shalanda. Uh, it has been a very, very interesting year. Uh, I've been very blessed to be able to work with you, co-chair and the mayor's uh, small business recovery uh, task force and, and being your partner in crime on the uh, downtown download webinar. Uh, this is our 23rd episode. Uh, I could not think of a way to end uh, what has been a very challenging year uh, on a higher note, talking about the Superblock project, which I'm incredibly excited about. And I also want to take a moment uh, to thank uh, the team from Downtown Partnership, uh, who week in, week out, have really made Shalanda and I look like rock stars. And the bottom line is we couldn't have done it uh, without their support, uh, without Mike Evitz and Lauren Hamilton and Nicole Rohr. So thank you so much to your team, Shalanda. Uh, and I'm going to pass it back over to you. No, thank you so much. You were right. I was saving that. You stole my thunder for the end, but that's okay. <laughs> Um, it, it, I can't thank them enough. I agree. And it's funny, I'm, I haven't been able to look at who's attending, but I also want to thank um, Mark Wasserman if he's on. It's funny because as we talked about the idea behind this councilman, he was really adamant about us even doing something like this together. And so I, I look forward to his continued leadership as well. So now, getting to all of the elements that we that everybody signed up for this to attend to. Um, Really, I know we're fortunate to have three members of the development team that was selected by BDC to take over the super block redevelopment. Um, and, and part of what's so beautiful about this selection is, is they are, they are ours, right? They're local to us, they're committed to us. And so when you talk about a development that has at its core, the thoughtfulness, the innovation, the sincerity, all of that stuff, it's coming because it's it's you know in them, and so I appreciate them. This area is critical to downtown, um, you know, and there have been a number of names, um, not all positive that they've you know that you've heard it called, but for all the progress that we're making in Charles Center and the University of Maryland Baltimore campus, it's been far too empty for far too long, and so the new development plan there is the latest positive news, and when complete, we'll join the new Lexington Market and revitalized arena to make this once grand neighborhood sparkle again. So please join me in welcoming Christopher Janion, founder and president of Vitruvius, John Pannoni, president of Landmark Partners, Baltimore, and Jason Williams, CEO of Mason Dixon Companies. So thank you, gentlemen. In terms of our format, just to let everybody know, I ask that you as attendees place your questions in the Q&A box and we'll get to them towards the end. I know Councilman Costello has some, uh, we want the hard questions for this one, okay? So give them the hard questions, but he'll go through a, a series of questions. Um, some we received earlier and some I know are on the hearts and minds of our attendees. So after Councilman Costello finishes, then we'll go to the questions that are in the Q&A box. All right, Councilman, take it away. 
Shalanda, thank you. And uh, it might be a little premature, but I think we have hit our record for attendance on a downtown download. We are at 135 participants. So really looking forward uh, to today's show. Um, Jason, Chris, John, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, really appreciate it. And again, looking forward to ending the year on a high note here, talking about something we've all been really excited about for a long time. Uh, a number of entities came together to form Westside Partners. And as Shalanda mentioned, this is a new partnership, uh, but the three of you are, are no strangers uh, to economic development in the city. And you guys have been doing great work here uh, for some time. Landmark Partners, Vitruvius, uh, Partner, and uh, Mason Dixon. Uh, the design firm uh, Gensler and creative agency Cohere are also engaged. How did you decide on this joint approach uh, and what does each company bring to the project? Uh, we'll start off with you, Jason. Sure. Well, thanks so much, Councilmember, and uh, thanks, Shalanda. You're such a champion for downtown. Councilman Costello, we've been working together in uh, these neighborhoods for so many years. Uh, you know, I think uh, what's exciting about this group, um, as you said, um, Shalanda, we're all from Baltimore. I mean, my uh, dad was a cab driver in Baltimore. Uh, he used to drive me through downtown, tell me about the energy and vigor. Um, my great grandfather was the bell ringer and small business owner in Lexington Market. So I'm very excited to get see that project uh, get back off the ground. Uh, and you know, we're we're investing in neighborhoods. We're we're community um, developers that are are now focused in on. Uh, revitalizing downtown. Uh, Councilman Costello, you said it early on, you know, the super block is kind of the heart. It's in the, it's in the center, it's connected, um, and there's a lot of energy. And Shalanda, thank you. You came right out of the gate. Let's do this. Let's move forward. Let's, let's take the steps uh, and let's partner together. So this group is really focused on the fact that we have these roots, but we are doing some great work in neighborhoods, but also bringing that great work downtown, what Chris is doing and what John are doing uh, in Mount Vernon and in the Bromo uh, Arts District already. So I'll turn it over to Chris and John if they want to add to that. Yeah, and um, I mean, we're really excited about the team uh, and all the members in it. Uh, you know, I've known John for, I can't even remember how long, uh, and Jason and I became really quick friends uh, when we first met. Um, so we already have a chemistry and we're already all aligned on what we want to do with this project. And I think the coming together was just so natural around um, such a large impactful project that our goals were completely aligned from the beginning and the whole partnership is just completely smooth. So we're all kind of thinking with three different heads and, and you know, executing all as one. So I think that that's been really special and, um, you know, we have the opportunity now, as we've seen throughout, you know, similar historic events to reset and innovate within our city as we come out of this pandemic. And I, I can't think of a better team to do it with. Yeah, Chris, I think you said it really well. And, and Jason, and look, we're, we're excited about this. This is a large project. It's an incredibly important, important project. So the ability for our, for our team to, um, to be able to work together and have worked together in the past and bounce ideas off each other to make sure that we are making the most prudent decisions as, as stewards of this project and, and the Bromo district is really critical. So having this strong team dynamic that is locally based with a true um, inherent understanding of what Baltimore is and what Baltimore needs um, is absolutely critical to, to the current and kind of future success of the neighborhood. Thanks guys. So this area, the coin, the super block is famous for its architectural and historical value. Uh, but those elements can also make redevelopment more complicated and challenging. Uh, many developers would prefer a clean site they can build from the ground up. How does historic preservation factor into your plans and how do you balance preservation with more current architecture? Yeah, I'll, I'll take this one. So, um, yeah, I think maybe maybe we're we're crazy, but I think all of us actually prefer projects that uh, that are a little more difficult and have some more challenges. Uh, but for us, one of one of the reasons we all you know went after this RFP and love this project and do other projects in Mount Vernon and other areas of Baltimore is that we are blessed to have a city with incredible architecture and bones and and it's not necessarily just the aesthetic, but it's what that historic programming and activity was. So when we look at these projects, 
um, we're saying, okay, how do we revitalize and bring back what that kind of beautiful historic character was from an aesthetic standpoint, but hey, how do we revitalize and bring that activity back? And the Bromo was, was the shopping district. Um, this is where you know, my grandmother took my mom on Sundays and they'd get dressed up and go shop and eat. And that was the hub. So how do we bring that historic nature back in its entirety? Um, I think what's, it, what's it really important for us is to your point, uh, Councilman, we, we balance that historic with the modern. And, and I think all of us and other projects and as we continue to, to plan this, um, keep that top of mind. So working with the relevant historical associations um, and, and making sure that when we're planning this, we are leading with the idea that the historic nature rides first. We need to make sure these buildings function appropriately and are best use. So bringing that modern element into it, um, but ultimately, I think it's our, our love of the, of the historic assets and the story of the area that that ride shotgun with the intent. Yeah, I mean, when, when we have such an amazing cultural district to begin with, it makes development uh, that much easier to bring it back. We don't have to reinvent the aesthetics of it. Um, and it's got character. So that's what we love about this block in particular and the neighborhood in general, is that the architecture there is amazing. Um, so we're really excited to you know, um, you know, mold both what was uh, to you know, what can be together and, and come up with a really amazing project uh, that lasts you know, 100 years, 200 years. We, we want something that, that isn't just um, you know, temporary. It, it needs to be something that is done for the future of development. And Councilman, just, just to, on, on that last point, you know, I spent most of my Saturday uh, walking through the properties. I, I went in, opened every gate, uh, went in with my team, walked through, saw them. Uh, my team did some of the history about each property, uh, what was happening. There were some community folk that were kind of trying to figure out what I was up to. They were stopping by and they were like, who are you? And they saw the name. They were like, oh, you, you guys are the team. Hey, I have some ideas. And I was like, sure, six feet away, but tell me your ideas. <laughs> like, like, what's going on? Like, uh, and, and what do you think? And, you know, some, some individuals were telling me the history. And, you know, I, I, I could feel the energy. They were just walking by and they saw activity. And I think that's what uh, we need to think through. Like, what, what kind of activities can we be doing now? But what, what's the history? Uh, the buildings are beautiful like in there and they are unique uh, and i had a couple of my adaptive reuse team members that that were in them and saying hey we can do some really cool things in here that'll bring the the energy but also keep the historic nature of these buildings like intact in the way that the city uh and the um uh and chap and others want us to and i think the community does as well uh, that's great. And, you know, one of the things that that I'm really ex that I know Shalon and I are both really excited about is um, many of your firms have a track record of successful development in the Bromo Arts District in and around Market Center uh, in downtown Mount Vernon, etc. Um, what convinced you guys to significantly expand your investment in this neighborhood uh, and specifically helping to Kind of bridge the gap where, where the super block is now and, and make that more vibrant and help connect the neighborhood together. Yeah, I think so. So you, you said it, we all have um, existing you know, developments and, and projects that we really care about in the surrounding areas and some directly in this area, some plan. I mean, Chris has uh, an incredible project, uh, a plan for, for the 400 block um, and with an expansion plan there. So I think when we look at Baltimore City as a whole, we look at how do we increase citywide circulation? How do we increase citywide activity? This is intended to be an amenity for the entire city. So why should we have a uh, kind of a, a currently blighted area right in the middle of such a, such a nexus of knowledge and education and business um, and social life? So when we, when we kind of set out on this, it was a natural path for, for our investment. And it's supported by a number of other investment, um, strong investment of quality development, which I think is important is important to note, which is lead with quality. Um, over the next five years, there's around $500 million of investment within this area, and all of which serves to support the, the greater cause of, of, of activation and uh, revitalization of, of what used to be and, and will be again. 
uh, a high activity, vibrant, um, culturally rich and, and unique um, city amenity. Yeah, um, I, I can second all of that. Uh, I've been involved in the Bromo for about eight years now. Um, and it started out when Maryland Art Place moved back to its original building on Saratoga Street. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, Maryland Art Place is an amazing arts organization uh, and it was formed in the early 80s on Saratoga Street. Um, we had a stint away from that building but came back about eight years ago and I'm the board chair. We renovated the entire building to uh, be a creative hub for artists and art organizations uh, over and above our first floor gallery space. So it's, it's an incubator for artists and we'll be opening up the basement as soon as it's, it's safe, you know, in the next couple of year or so. Um, but the neighborhood has, again, such amazing bones. It was built to be a cultural and shopping destination. So um, it, to me, and I think to our whole team, it's a no brainer that this needs to be the next best neighborhood in the city. And we can create something here as a whole, because it's not only gonna be our project, but there are amazing developers, both big and small, that are working in the neighborhood currently. Um, you know, Seawall at, at Lexington Market, and a handful of other uh, developments that are within blocks are going on right now. So this is the time for the Bromo to come back, and we're just really excited to be a part of it. And, and to the point of just partnerships, um, we're reaching out to the other developers and the other stakeholders uh, in the area. Like, what are you up to? What are, what are your thoughts? What are you hearing? You might be out, you might have been a little bit further ahead of us out in the community uh, listening to what, what, what's working uh, and what you're seeing. So, you know, those uh, strategic partnerships are important, but also, Shalanda, you mentioned earlier about the marketing of the city and Councilman Costello, I know you've traveled and, and, and market, marketed Baltimore. Uh, you know, I'm excited that we invested in One North Charles Street, which is right down the, the street, and moved my offices there. And uh, we are redoing that building with my business partners, who are incredibly incredible at adaptive reuse and coming into the city of Baltimore. I uh, soon will be announcing early next month, Shalanda will be excited. Uh, 20,000 square feet of that building is being taken by a very unique entity. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll make that announcement with, when it's time. But also, uh, one of my clients on my consulting side of my business, uh, Palmar International just announced that they are, uh, last month, it was in the Business Journal, that they're moving to Baltimore. Uh, they are about to announce as well next month, uh, you know, that they found a spot that, they, that they're very excited about. So there's energy. There's like, I mean, that these corporations are picking to move from Northern Virginia, from Tyson Corner, and they're placing a bet on Baltimore City. Uh, and they're connected to us. They know us. Uh, but they also know that we are invested in neighborhoods and you're, we really want to find ways like Shalon and Eric that you can be out there with us advocating and saying, hey, this is a great project. You should join us. Like you should see, you get in on it now uh, because that that is what I wanna make sure people know that the super block and the compass and what we're trying to bring is what Baltimore City deserves. Yeah, and J Jason, I, I just want to add that for a second. Um, I think that you, you mentioned the kind of collective of developers and stakeholders and community members that we have in the neighborhood. Kristen Mitchell from Market Center has been amazing at pulling everybody together and creating focus groups and updating everyone. I mean, I, I don't know if I've ever been in a room together with 20 other developers that were all kind of working in the same neighborhood. Uh, and, and Kristen just done an amazing job in, in doing that. So I want to thank her for, for her efforts. And she's out volunteering when we were helping build the uh, uh, the Bromo Arts like uh, pop up, uh, like uh, we were supplying it uh, with construction materials. I, I ran into her and she was out building building the park. I mean that's that's true community partnership. So it was exciting to, to have her out there and have her as a partner. Well, Kristen's been a great partner as has Market Center Merchants Association. Uh, based in the firms you mentioned, uh, to me it sounds like <clears throat> they're making a very smart bet. Uh, I think they're making the right decision to move to Baltimore City. Um, I want to, uh, I think this is a good transition to talk a little bit about opportunities for community engagement. Jason, I know you mentioned you had talked to some, some folks in the community about their ideas. Talk to us a little bit about what that community engagement and outreach piece looks like. Yeah, I think uh, it's, 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 first of all, it's critically important. And really, that's 
phase one in like that's step one you know like what what's happening what what's what are your what are your thoughts what are your hopes uh we've been meeting with uh various groups uh already kind of leading up to to, to listen to them i think that's always the first step like listen listen engage uh gain feedback the, the type of team we're putting together uh also think that way um you know how do we bring in people's ideas how do we think about what's needed uh, in the neighborhood. Um, you know, Downtown Partnership has done, as well as Market Center has done so many studies and focus groups, like we're scouring through those to like gleam ideas, but then uh, talk, them, talk them through. Uh, in the first quarter of next year, uh, we'll be launching uh, the Compass website, uh, where we'll have an opportunity for community members to like sign up to meet with us, to engage with us, to, 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 to look at, their, to get their thoughts out there on what it could be, but also um, to my earlier point, sell Baltimore. Like, hey, these are all the cool things that are happening. This is all the investment, get in now. Uh, so we're gonna be um, out. Uh, we have uh, upcoming meetings with uh, community organizations. We're open, like through any means, request them. You know, Chris, uh, John and I like being out and about, uh, and uh, it's a little bit more easy with the Zooms. Uh, but also there's other stakeholders. We had a great meeting with the Greater Baltimore Committee Board on Friday where, you know, we pointed out that there are some in, in powerful institutions downtown that are making investments that, you know, should be looking at this project and saying, what are your fresh and, and thoughtful ideas if you were a partner with us and, and looking at this project. You know, there are issues around food insecurity. What does that look like in downtown Shlanda? I've heard you speak to that. Council member, you speak to that all the time. Um, you know, and then you've got people like my mom who just sold her house out in Baltimore County and now she's at Two Hopkins and she's loving life. She, she is 69 years old, living downtown and she, you know, now she's in my ear. She's like, hey, I need this. I want to walk to work. I need, you know, <laughs> how do we get that energy and, and pull those uh, pieces together? But also uh, I saw someone mention like the history, um, like how do we also tell the history and hold to it of the project? So the city's board of estimates just approved the $4.5 million sale of the properties to your team. Uh, talk to us a little bit about where you are in the development timeline. Uh, do you feel optimistic about financing in the middle of the COVID recession? And how soon do you think we can realistically see shovels in the ground? Um, so we're, we're really excited that everything was just approved. And as Jason stated, our first order of business is to listen. Um, you know, as, as we're working through initial concept design on the project, we're listening and we want to engage with the community and stakeholders uh, to help inform some of our decisions that are being made. Uh, and then like any development project, we need uh, a, a really great concept plan uh, to come together and one that we can execute on. We are planning on phasing this project uh, because all at once with so many historic buildings, it would be incredibly difficult to do one full sweep and, and look at this as you know, two full blocks of construction all at once unless, um, I, I, and I think that's part of the reason why it hasn't gone anywhere in 17 years. Uh, we wanted to take a fresh approach. We wanted to look at you know, how uh, the future of development really looks. And um, we are going full steam ahead with our phase one. Um, so, once we are engaged with the community and stakeholders, we'll be going into our conceptual design. And you know, as, as soon as we can get a shovel in the ground, that's, that's our goal. Yeah, and we're, we are all familiar with, with the tail of the tape here on this project. So to Chris's point, um, our fervent intent to, to phase this and make sure we're being responsible um, is critical. And we also want to be transparent. So as we continue on with our pre-development of, of these phases and um, and start to realize that you know the, the true timelines and true deliverables that we're going to be able to stick to and be held responsible to as developers because we need to be held responsible and accountable and we want to be. Um, we're going to be very transparent with you know, delivering those uh, expectations out to the community. Yeah, and I think also like we're going to be very active in updating our website. We're going to you know have our social media up soon because uh, we want we want to interact and we also want to inform. 
Um, so people like to, to John's point, to be transparent, this is where we are. Uh, these are our, these are our next steps, um, and that that there's activity that people can see that there's activity, and I think that's something. Um, you know that area of downtown in the Shalom, You can correct me if I'm wrong. That's what people want. They want to see us out doing things. You know, it was it was great walking the community. I want to do it more often because uh, it's it's my neighborhood. My my office building is two blocks away. I should be walking in, in the neighborhood a little bit more often and and listening to what people are up to and just not in community meetings, but you know, as safely as possible, like what people are saying on the streets of what they want and what they're looking for. Shalanda, you can tell, uh, so Shalanda can see the questions that we're gonna ask. And, and Shalanda, I think it's pretty clear uh, for folks to be able to tell how familiar you and I are working with Chris, Jason, and John, because they pretty much answered our next question, which was uh, the elephant in the room. Tell us, you know, the tale of the tape, as you mentioned, John, after 17 years. Uh, tell us why this time going around is going to be different. Uh, I think you guys did a great job of answering that. Uh, I know that I'm extremely confident uh, that this time it is going to work out. I know that uh, BDC, the city downtown partnership, uh, we're extremely excited about that um, in this opportunity for you guys and for the neighborhood. Uh, Shalanda knows I always go off script at least once uh, per episode. Um, I want you guys to uh, I'm just going to do rapid fire here, and then I want to jump back over to Shalanda because we have a number of questions from our audience. Uh, we'll start with Chris and then Jason and John. Uh, summarize for me in one sentence, what's the most exciting part about this project and, and the opportunity that we have for the neighborhood on uh, downtown's west side and specifically Bromo and Market Center? I'm, I might do more than one sentence, but... <laughs> we'll let it slide. Um, I mean, like I said, we, we've got the opportunity to reset and innovate within our city as we come out of this pandemic. There's no better time. Um, we're almost at a blank slate, unfortunately, because of, of you know, the, the middle of this pandemic. Um, but we can benefit from the, the rise of remote work and creating an affordable arts and innovation centric community. Um, you know, we can help retain talent and companies that are coming out of our universities. Uh, we can focus on attracting new entrepreneurial talent and capital to our city. And what we really want to do here is create, a, you know, a 15 minute neighborhood um, where everything you need in your day to day life can be reached easily. Uh, it gives us the opportunity to build a more equitable and more inclusive neighborhood while making it more livable and amenity rich. And we, we've got two blocks to work with in the heart of downtown. So all of that makes me very excited. John, I think you're up next. Well, it's hard to follow that that, <laughs> that, uh, that Chris talk. Um, no, I, like I, to, to echo what Chris said, um, for us, I, I think the retention and the growth and the entrepreneurial hub that we have the capacity to create here with partnerships with relevant stakeholders. I mean, we have an incredible education system here in here in Baltimore. And one thing we've we as a partnership have talked about and our partners landmark have talked about over time is how do we make sure we retain that so to chris's point talent uh you know talent retention is huge so how do we we build the tools and the infrastructure to do that so that's that's really exciting for me i think the other piece is the historical side we have a blank slate but it's a blank slate that was postured by a, an incredible story some time ago so we have the opportunity to take that story and take the assets that were there and the, the soul that was there and bring it, bring it back and bring it back in a modern way and design to that, both from an aesthetic standpoint and a programming perspective. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna take this like just personally, you know, I wish my cab driver the father was still around to see today, like, and, and just see kind of where we are, I mean, he lived in Sandtown, Winchester on Pennsylvania and, and Sanford Street, um, you know, and I lived with him for, you know, like half my life and, you know, lived out in the county with my mom um, and uh, moved back in the city the second I got the opportunity to uh, after college. But, you know, I, I want to ensure and I'm working and this team believes in its core that there is an equity, diversity and opportunity mission that we have with this project that we have to open up doors for entrepreneurs and you know people who want to learn how to like do a development project that that no matter what neighborhood you're from like this is your downtown too and you're welcome here and and there and there's access and ways to get down here not only for jobs but for entertainment and excitement you know when i talked to senator haynes he said look we have too many 
young black professionals that like, you know, they, they're doing well and they decide that they want to move out of the city because they want more amenities, but, or, or they want to move to DC or Atlanta because they want that downtown 15 minute neighborhood feel. We can do that. There, there's, we can do that here in Baltimore. I am an internal optimist that we can do great things and I'm watching them happen. And I think together, if we can pull that message together, we can go out there and sell that council member and we can get some, some more and more people coming in. Shalanda, we can do the same all over uh, uh, downtown and, and have this as a, as a jump off point for even more activity that spreads out into our neighborhoods, but also brings our neighborhood people in. To, so they're, that they feel as though they're, it's their project. So. Right, we, we talked about a drop the mic moment, Jason. <laughs> I, think you, I think you hit upon a drop the mic moment. That is the essence of what this, this project and I think what the revitalization and reinvigoration of our city is about. So exciting stuff there. Councilman, did you have some more? I know, I know the that's, that's questions you, are, are coming got a ton in of questions from hot audience. and heavy. Um, I'm going to stay there, Jason, where you were. And in some of these questions, I'll combine because you know some of them you answered, but would like a little bit of elab elaboration. One of the questions really talks about you know how did you decide what that mix of use would be? What what are the design elements within sort of the design, and what will be included in phase one of that? So, I think, uh, so um, I'll take the last part of your question first with respect to what is in phase one, we are working, um, we're working to identify what the most appropriate use is for phase one with the stakeholders and, and partners we have, um, and what the, the best path to showing um, quick but responsible momentum in this project is. So uh, to Chris's point, our first step is to listen, and we're working with our, our teams, with Gensler and the, and the rest of the rest of the initiative to um, to identify what that final phase one looks like. And again, we'll be transparent about that once we uh, once we're confident in what we're delivering to to the community. Um, with respect to to design and and kind of use mix, we said, okay, we want to we want the Bromo to be a, a revival revitalize an active neighborhood. So what does that mean? What's not currently there? What needs to be there? What's currently there, but we can create something to feed off of it and create this kind of collective idea of uses to support one another um, and to act as a hub for, for an entire neighborhood. So that was really the driver there. How do you make sure you have all the amenities you need for a strong quality of life in a walkable area? Yeah, and we're, you know, we're building for the end user. And uh, so, you know, and the end user on the first floor uh, is mostly the entire city and visitors that come to it. So you know, we're, we're looking at how we can form this mix of uses on the first floor to be impactful. And uh, small businesses are going to need a lot of support after uh, we come through this pandemic. And we're you know, working on different ways to help support and grow and start more small businesses because um, you know, a lot of people are really hurting right now. So we want to focus on that when we're delivering um, uh, the first floors of these projects. And we're also going to work with stakeholders uh, in the area and see what they need. Uh, and we've had these conversations going over the past few months. So um, I, we're working on a mix of uses and it will sometimes change, but that's kind of how a phased project works. And, and we'll build to um, hopefully get the best project out of it. No, absolutely. So in, in the process, thank you, in the process of developing and redeveloping, are you open to entertaining additional partnerships with others they say that may have a speci specific use for property that is compatible with your vision? I, I think it would be, need to be a little bit more specific, um, uh, but we, we look at partnerships um, in many different ways. And I think that partnering with other organizations or groups, especially ones that have specific missions around what we're trying to do, is a, a wonderful idea. And we've, we've looked at that before. Um, we currently are looking at it. So, um, you know, we would take it on a case-by-case -case basis, but we want to, again, be open and accommodating 
uh, to people's ideas and organizations' ideas as to how they can be truly impactful within the project and within the city in general. No, which is good. Staying on the partnership piece, um, currently are um, UMB and UMMC partners in any way in the project? I think until we formalize anything, um, you know, we're, we're discussing this project with every stakeholder and community member that we can. Um, and clearly, all of the big institutions around us are stakeholders in this project. And um, so we will be working with everyone, whether it's, you know, keeping the conversations open or truly a formal partnership uh, that will be yet to be seen. Um, but we're absolutely speaking with everybody, small and large. And to, uh, to Chris's point, like, you know, after we, a lot of those partners were on the call on Friday, and then we started reaching out to them. I actually sat around, wrote them all, handwritten notes, like, <laughs> their time, but also, hey, we, we want to reach out to you before you reach out to us. Like, and that's kind of like who, like who we are. What are your ideas, hopes, dreams? What plans have you started to make? You know, does this fit into a, a narrative that you're trying to accomplish for your university and for others um, or for your partnership or for seniors or you know for small business like uh, you know I was on a, a call over the weekend where I was like listening to like entrepreneurs saying how they were trying to figure out co-working space to reduce costs so we're really listening and um, you know I, I mentioned Senator Haynes earlier he's uh, requested that I come and speak to another group of local entrepreneurs that are trying to figure out how to like, you know, have that downtown office space where they can show off but still have investment. How does that connect? So we're connecting downtown to community like at the same time. Right, which makes perfect sense. As you, as you expand um, on that business piece, are there thoughts, goals around either local and or MBE participation in the project? 100%. Um, we haven't set what those goals like will be. Um, but you know, I, I've always thought and you know, on the consulting side, and I come out of economic development that um, goals are a floor, not a, not a ceiling. Like, you know, when you set a goal, like, you need to, you know, um, figure out like access, like, do people have access to get there to get to work Do people have the resources financially to, to support the project in the future. These are conversations we should be having now. Uh, you know, do um, do uh, like what what MBE partners should we be discussing like with like to see if there's capabilities like so as we're building our team we've got that mindset like right. who, what are we doing with and what are we doing with Baltimore City businesses like uh, and and those that are located in the city we we understand that like like keeping wealth uh, here in right. small is, is critical uh, to growth and then also council member and Shalana you've said it's critical to recovery like we're on this recovery path you know how are we having these conversations how are we listening now on how we can do that uh, in, an, in an equitable and also a wealth building way yep which is which is appreciated so definitely yes to local in some form or fashion MBE we heard it as well what about um, the affordability of some of the units? Will there be an inclusion of any affordable residential units? So I, we want to create a really interesting mixed income neighborhood. Uh, and, and that's, I think, what is going to be different than uh, a lot of different neighborhoods in the city is, uh, is we can really create um, units that are absolutely affordable and ones that are, are more luxurious uh, within the same project. So when, when you have the ability to, um, uh, to create this mixed income space, not only just for the people living there, but for the entire community that's going to interact with this project for years and years to come, uh, that's what we have the opportunity to do and that's what we're excited about doing. Which is great. Thank you. Um, now the money question is flooding the line. Show us the money. No, or is there an um, estimated cost for the project? And is there financing already lined up? And if not, people are saying, is there still an opportunity to get in? So uh, loaded question. Yeah. So look, I, I think with with respect to capital, um, we 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 hold we hold capital pretty close to our chest, and I think that's that's the responsible thing to do. Um, there's always potential opportunities and, and we welcome anyone to reach out and we're happy to 
to speak through that. Um, for us, again, this is a phase project and it's with, uh, with phase with different uses. So there's smart capital for those specific uses and we'll work with, um, with those parties and the relationships we all have, as well as other stakeholders and the city and the state to make sure we're, um, we're building the smartest capital stacks possible and, and, and appropriate for the project. Thank you. And, and are you releasing any numbers or anything on estimated costs? We're not at this time. Um, we're not at this time. If, if that's something we feel comfortable doing in the future that we believe um, kind of benefits the community and, and, and our narrative um, and, and the end goal, we absolutely will, but, but not at this time. No, definitely understand that. So people are talking about tours of the space and as you start to develop and, and what, how you know, people will be able to come and sort of participate throughout, are you planning any of those sort of socially distant, um, you know, peaks into what's to come? Yes. Yeah, the, answer, the answer is yes. Um, and we're, we're working to, to Jason's point earlier, you know, we're, we are working on our, our landing page and website and other, um, you know, interaction points. We will absolutely host other uh, events and, and community engagement activities at the site. I think, you know, they are, um, Unfortunately, the sites are not in a very safe condition right now in, inside. So uh, health and safety is our is first and foremost our our biggest concern. So we will we will absolutely do that. But we've got a little work to do when it comes to giving full tours to make sure that um, uh, that no one's falling through the floor. So and, yeah, to John's point, one hundred percent. I I just walked through all the properties and I was very thoughtful and careful, <laughs> like. Uh, <laughs> internally but you know um but i did really enjoy walking the block learning some of the history so we're thinking through some of that and we're heading into the winter and COVID, so there might be more opportunities around that um when we get back to the spring when it's warmer weather but we want to be visible we want to be out there we want to know want people that they want to come out and talk to us and and, and uh, they want us to meet them at the site happy to do that um i think that that it's very very visual and you know, I hope to do like a little history walk. Uh, so, and we've got some local artists that are coming up with ideas to, you know, continue to beautify the neighborhood even before, you know, like, you know, construction and other things starts and concepts are figured out. So we're taking those ideas to heart and discussing them and figuring out how to make steps forward. Wonderful. This question, and it's come in a couple times talking about celebrating the history of what was there and whether or not you're planning to highlight the important role that Reed's lunch counter played um, in the civil rights movement or any other ways that maybe there's some uh, museum aspects of what could exist on the site. Any thoughts there? We will absolutely be celebrating the history of, of, the, of the two blocks throughout the development in a number of different ways and celebrating the arts and the cultural side of things, both um, inside the assets, outside, so on and so forth. And I, with Reed's drug story, you know, it, it, it played such an important history. We will absolutely be celebrating that. And I think the other piece is Reed's drug store. Um, it, it wasn't just, well, just that, it was a community space and where people congregated. Um, and I think we are looking at ways to take that concept and apply it to uh, a modern use. Right, no, it makes sense. Um with the connection and this this piece is interesting, I think as we start to think about what's missing in downtown and opportunities there, it's a question about um, whether or not there's thoughts of adding a mid-sized grocer or something like that to add to the criteria of the design. I know you said that you are listening, but any pre-thoughts of some elements like that in the in the plans? We are, we're looking at, a bunch of different uses that are going to be really impactful in the neighborhood, and um, as you know, Jason mentioned food insecurity, and um, that is one of our priorities in, in addressing within this project. So as of right now, uh, we've got a lot of first floor space, and when the mix comes together uh, in the right way, we we're going to be considering um, uses similar to that. Uh, I think it's a little bit um, uh, too premature to say that this is exactly what we're going to be putting um, in this specific right. space. But um, again, the really um, cohesive mix of tenants on the first floor is very important to us. And, and we want to address both the immediate neighborhood and the city at large. 
you know, which is which is perfect. And when you talk about the city at large and the transportation connections in that area, I know we've just gone through something similar even with Lexington Market because there is high connectivity in that area. One of the questions talks about, you know, whether or not transportation is on the agenda for this project. Um, really in making sure it's connected to other parts of the city and opportunities for residents and businesses. Have you moved to that phase of the conversations and considerations as well? No, oh, I can answer part of that because like we're doing some construction on projects downtown and transportation is a, is a, it's like, it's a true economic development and equity issue. It's something that personally for me on the construction side is something I think of all the time is like my team members are trying to get to downtown to not only like work within our building, but also work on other construction projects and take our maintenance fans out. And uh, so it's something that, you know, we're gonna be listening very closely to. We hope to bring together uh, and work closely. I know that um, Shalanda and council member, you both are very involved with the upcoming, like the transition, love to hear what their ideas around transportation are. And, uh, you know, I used to take the light rail uh, down into the city from the county, from my mom's house. So, you know, it's, there's there's op, there's there's a lot of cool intersections of transportation right at the super block. Like, how do we connect those? How do we think through? How do we think about people getting there and and opportunities and and even um, you know how we connect it to communities so you know you can make it there. Uh, I have a team member that we we're trying to come up with a different trans transportation method because like he gets on the bus at like six in the morning to get to work. 7:30, and he like comes all the way across the city. Uh, now more individuals are doing it. So, like for me, it's personal, like as well, yeah. as part of this upcoming project. You know, same here, and it's it's great to hear. I can tell you from just the initial insight that transportation is a key component of Mayor Scott's agenda. So, I think all of these pieces will tie together. I'm gonna wrap it up with one statement, and then Councilman, I'm gonna come back to you so that you can get some final thoughts before we close it out. But we have a comment that says, we at Catholic Relief Services are extremely excited about this project and development. Having been enticed by the city to our present space in the former Stewart's building in 2007, this is a long time coming. And so just to echo the sentiments of the excitement of what this is going to do to the Bromo um, district. I know Emily from our team is extremely excited. She's with Downtown Partnership and also running a Bromo Arts and Entertainment District. And so all of the partners that you mentioned, Kristen, I mean, I, I could not be more thankful and appreciative for the rallying of everybody. All of what we generally would call the ABC soups and sometimes organizations that work you know, in competition, we've been working collectively like never before. And I think that will help further the development there. So Councilman, I wanna come back to you to get some closing thoughts before I wrap at the end. Thanks, Yolanda. Uh, Chris, Jason, John, I just wanna thank you guys for your continued commitment to Baltimore City, um, investing in projects that aren't the easiest projects uh, and figuring out ways to make it work. I, I could not be more excited about the potential for this project for down side, for Bromo Arts District, for Market Center, et cetera. Um, and Shalanda, again, want to thank you for 23 amazing episodes. Uh, I know we had a question, uh, is this the end of the run? Absolutely not. Uh, we've got a number of great episodes in the works. Uh, we will be back in January, bigger, stronger, and better. Uh, some exciting shows, really looking forward to it. Uh, and again, thank you to everyone from the Downtown Partnership. And most importantly, thank you to our audience for tuning in. Uh, week in and week out uh, to hear about different happenings around downtown. Back to you, Shalanda. No, thank you. Thank you. Ditto, ditto, ditto on the thank yous. Um, there are a couple questions that were in the chat that are specific to downtown partnership. And for many of them, we've taken the name. So I'll reach out to you all specifically to make sure that we're answering. Wanted to get the questions relevant to the project um, answered first. So thank you. Please know, as Councilman Costello said, this is the last for this year. We're starting back in January of 2021. And so we look forward to having you join us. These sessions are on our website. I saw that question. So please vi visit our website, godowntownbaltimore.com. I could not end without doing another thank you to the team. Mike Evitz, thank you for the, the sleepless nights and in, in making sure that we had the right questions. I thank you. Lauren um, Hamilton and Nicole War is Councilman talked about this team 
rock stars. So thank you for that. To my board members and board chair, Mark Wasserman, who's on the line, I thank you for your continuous support in one, in, in trusting my leadership as we kind of transition through COVID and we learn this thing together and for being you know, a resource for me and for the organization and for our city overall. You know, when we talk about these things, we're talking about, you know, an appreciation for our city and a love for our city. And I could hear it in Jason, Chris, John, and, you know, always you councilmen. It's something about Baltimore that's different than any place else. It's electric. And when we get people here and people who are committed and willing to invest in us, you know, amazing things are bound to happen. So thank you all for tuning in. We will see you on the other side of the new year and have a good day. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.